On this Handycam, there's always a little release switch for your battery, which allows you to take it out. If you look at, you'll see slots, which only allow it to go in one way. It can't go that way, because these flanges here must match up with those flanges. And also so, your power, your power connectors. The when bottom. you slot your battery in, click it in, this is a record button, which will start your camera recording, or stop it recording. To switch on your camera as normal with any other camera, if you look on the side here, you'll see camera, off or charge, and player. If you want to play from your camera onto a monitor, you set it up onto player. If you want to switch your camera on to normal camera mode, switch it so that your power comes down to there. You have to press in to get from off onwards, you have to press in the green button. Otherwise, the switch doesn't move. A simple mechanical fail safe. On the back of your camera, you've got a power in, DC in, where you can charge your battery while it's on the camera. Or you can run the camera off power. Make sure that your plug is going in the right way. By looking inside the hole, seeing which side the open end of your switch is. There's an open end and a closed end. Try and secure your cables to your camera somehow so that it doesn't break the plug or the camera. That'll cost you a lot of money to fix. There we go. On your handycams, a lot of them have an eyepiece which you need to pull out to actually be able to see through, otherwise it's really blurry. Once you've pulled it out, you can actually set your eye focus on the little slider knob there to get your eye focus right. On top of most of these handycams, you have a photo knob, which as you press it, will take a photo. Unfortunately, it takes about five seconds to take the photo, so your camera is out of action for those five seconds. The normal zoom bar, which will take your camera tighter, will go in on your lens or come out as you zoom out or zoom in. Here's where the night shot switch is. Simple on or off, depending on whether your menu is set to on or off. So if it's set to off in your menu, it won't work when you have it on here. It will always be off there no matter whether your menu is on or off. You have a hot shoe on your camera which has got a little protective plate in it to keep out dust etc. Inside that there are contacts so you must make sure which way the your output. audio output contacts here yeah, or a light or the hot shoe. So keep that closed if you can, if you can ever find it once you've dropped it and lost it. There it is. Alright, put it in. Okay, keeping it in and closed. On the side of the camera here, we've got a USB input. Which you can use for your USB streaming function, or you can link up your camera to your PC. Then you have a DV out, Firewire DV out. Over here you have a plug input, a plug output for your audio, video, gives you output from your camera to a monitor or and speakers. And speakers. Audio, audio and audio video, video out. Sound out. The headphones. So you can monitor your sound. Normal stereo mini jack. Then we have plug-in power for your mic, which means you get a phantom powered mic in there. At the bottom there you've got LANC, it's a local area network connection that allows you to remotely control your camera from another camera. So if you've got a multi-camera setup and you're the only camera operator available, you can switch between what each camera is seeing and adjust the camera's view and exposure and focus, etc. You have an S video out. This panel here is your infrared, infrared and your autofocus 
when you're holding your camera, don't cover it with your fingers if you're holding your camera like this because it won't get focused. You've got a flip screen on the side here which can rotate but only in one direction. So as you get it, click in the open switch, pull it open. If you want to mount it flat on the side of your camera, rotate it all the way around, anti-clockwise only, and click it back in. When you've clicked it back in, you can also see through your eyepiece. On the inside of your lens, you have thread, which can take any filter or extra lenses or polarizers. Be very careful with those as this thread is usually made out of plastic and strips very easily. On the bottom of your camera, you have two holes. One's got thread inside it, which takes a quarter inch. Not 10 mil or 6 mil, it takes quarter inch, which is the old standard for all uh, home cameras. The hole in front of it with no thread inside it is merely a registration hole to hold your base plate that you put onto the base of your camera straight okay. forward. If, this, if, the, if your mounting screw is too long, you will. it might break in to your camera and damage IC board. Blah, blah, blah. Move on. If you need to eject your tape, if you need to eject your tape, you push forward on your open eject and it pull open the cover and the camera automatically by itself ejects that tape. Then you can take your tape out or put your tape in, making sure that your record tab on the tape if you're going to record, is open. To get that tape back into the camera, you have to push where it says push. Pushing it anywhere else will cause damage to the delicate mechanisms inside. Don't push anywhere here. Once you've got that tape in softly, you push at that point only. Push it in until it locates, let go, and the camera does the rest. You can feel the tape lacing up, then you can close the side cover. If you want to sync up to the last couple of frames on your last take, press N search and it'll rewind, play through it and then park in the correct place. You have a fader on the camera which will give you a normal fader, a mosaic fader, bounce fader, and monotone fader. So if you go normal fader, as you start recording, it will fade in to your picture. And it fades up. Fade from black. Rather do that on your edit. Then we enter the real menu. Aha. In order to get into any of these items on your menu, you need to press execute. It will go into the item. If you actually use your digital zoom, you're going to get degradation times. of your picture. And show them. Your digital zoom actually gives you a loss of quality when you zoom in and use that digital zoom. It magnifies the pixels that you have optically, but doesn't actually have true quality. It just magnifies what is there. As you can see, the snowy feeling comes um, Everything goes slightly out of focus, it seems. Not so kind of weird. Yeah, it looks Horrible. like snow to me. Very unprofessional. Keep it off. Next, you've got a 16, 16 by 9. Wide. Wide. Not true. It's what you see on the monitor effect. is a stretched picture of the same picture. Uh, a normal 4x3 television can't play 16 by 9 out. You need a 16 by 9 Switchable Wide, monitor. Yeah, widescreen um, television or monitor. So to actually view your picture on. If you want the 16 by 9 look, it's often a good idea to shoot on the 4 by 3 aspect and then to crop it in your post production, not so. Yeah, although you're going to be able to get it out on this camera because you're seeing what you've got in picture on yeah. your screen. Yes. Sure the 16 by 9 it relates to the ratio between the 16 units of distance across 
the horizon of your screen, and the nine would relate to the height. nine units of distance in your height. So it's a ratio between the two, between long, your flat. Much better for composition because, of course, the human eye sees widely and doesn't see in a square the way televisions have been set up. Huge mistake, way four. back when someone got it wrong. This Probably. is normal, four by three. Four, uh, three by four. Four by three, yeah. One to, th one to one point three 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 recurring. When you break that ratio down. 16 by nine, have we done that? Steady shot. It's a very useful. Very useful for hand holding your camera. Or on the tighter end of everything. On a wide shot, you don't really need to use it. If you're on a head, you don't really want to use it because steady shot has lag when you operate your camera, which could start irritating, the interfering, eye. interfering with your operating. Yeah, it tries to second guess the human operator and fails dismally. Night shot light on the other side. Yeah, that's your night shot. Ah, so this is the effect they've been using all those reality shows for yeah. that long. You can pick up a nothingness of light. Okay. This gives you that wonderful green. What it's actually doing is it's emitting an infrared beam from the front of the camera, which extends to a certain distance, which will allow you to see objects in the dark. But beyond that distance, everything goes black again. That's On your LCD. Leave it there when you're shooting so that you know what no, is happening eyes, no. to your colors. SP and LP. Keep it on SP, it'll be better quality. LP is long play, you'll get more time recording out, but you're going to have a lot of drop frames and color problems and things like that with it. Audio mode. Keep it on the highest that there is. That's the sampling rate, and you want the highest sampling rate. It grabs more information per second than the lower sampling rate. Better quality. You hit the little button. It's one frame record. You hit the button. It takes one picture at a time. Five seconds, it and it records one. audio. There you go. Bit of an interruption if you. Sorry. But you're recording your one frame per second every time you press the button. Interval record needs to be set. I've done this. And you have a couple of options interval. of interval, which are 30 seconds, one minute, or five minutes, or ten minutes between each amount of footage that you're shooting. Ten minutes would be for the growing of a plant, for instance, whereas one minute might show you a difference in clouds. So, a bit of experimentation. The time that she's going to record the, for. The, the amount, amount of, of footage you're actually going to record, which could be half a second all the way through to two seconds. If you just need one frame, unfortunately, you'll have to edit out one frame in your post-production. And then Off. when you... Set you have to see. leave it on if you actually want to shoot. That's right. And consider your lighting conditions, whether you want to lock off your exposure and see the interval type. Or whether you want to leave auto on because that will affect things. It's recorded as half second already as you switch it on, and then after 30 seconds of waiting, you will it see should record coming. another half a second. Very useful for growing of cakes. Time lapse photography basically. Bread rising, plants growing. Chickens hatching. The trouble is you're only getting half a second. If you're doing there we clouds, go. It's now recording. Stand by. It records the half second. It records half this half second. And it's gone. And now we should stop. And then it's gone. Okay. Let's Carry switch on. that off. Function. Suddenly it's on 16 bit. Menu. Execute. Interval record. Ex zip, zip, zip. Execute. Come down to off to switch it off. No matter what your settings are, execute that. That's the end of that page of the menu. Let's return to the next one. The next one, which is your clock set, your USB stream, and your language. Okay, 
Okay. World time. Execute. Yeah, you can, uh, instead of having to change your time, you just go in there and you say plus an hour, minus an hour, depending on your world time zone. Depending on where in the world you are. Time, yeah. If you want to hear your camera switching on and off, you, got the beep you can ex Maybe execute you this. You can put on menu. Can you hear this? Mm -hmm. yeah. You have two options on your display here if you want to only come out of your LCD screen on the side of your camera or if you want to come out of your video out and your LCD screen so that you can play to a big monitor. Tally light. Tally light. You can switch it on or off. If you're switching it, you switch it off if you don't want people to know that you're rolling while you're shooting them so that you don't have this little red light because a lot of people know that they what a tally lamp is and can see that the, the, they are being recorded by the camera. Um, if you're shooting rehearsals to try and get natural reactions, you might want to leave it off. Otherwise, leave it on so that you know when you're it's recording coming. or not. No. Page two, you have three items. Self-timer, so you put the camera there and after. After a certain amount of time, your camera will switch on. You can see there's a little logo here which has got a little clock on it. That means that after a certain amount of time, when you, as you press record, it will sit there for a whole four, five, six. Allowing you to seven, rush into position and shoot your own shot. Of uh, yourself. Like a stills camera. Normal yeah. switch off. Next. On page two, we have LCD brightness, which you can set. LCD so LCD. this is a good item to check on your menu. And sometimes sure keep it a middle. little lower so that you're not fooled by your LCD screen. Yeah. Rather underexposed video. Rather. Than overexposed video. Video loses you lose it all on the high end, but you might save something on the low exposures. Accept it. And volume is your built-in speaker's volume. Oh. That volume purely controls the speaker volume of your camera. That's not what it's recording. Not yeah. on this camera. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Cut. That's Very your speaker. Important. Yeah, your speaker. Right, off we go into the menu on this delicious little camera. Uh, there we have auto shutter. Leave it off. Progressive scan. If that's on, takes a all pixels up front, like stills photo. This is at 12 frames per second at, at current on progressive scan. Good for sh uh, shooting for computer monitors, of course, um, because those operate on progressive scan. So you're shooting in their native language. But if you want to show it on TV, I don't suggest you put progressive scan on too often, unless you have a, done your tests, of course. Digital zoom. Hmm? If you are shooting a progressive scan, watch panning over. Yeah. Watch your panning speeds and your tilting speeds over horizontal lines. They blur and, and shudder, judder. 16 by 9 wide. That's what it does, as you know. Steady shot on. It's good. AE shift. That sets my auto exposure shift so that. If I want everything one stop underexposed, I can just set it there and when the automatic iris sets itself, it will set it one stop underexposed. Um, you can run into a lot of trouble with this. But if you're shooting in snow, that's probably a good idea. Indeed. If you're shooting snow or outside in this, in this um, desert um, or the sea, you could do something like that, drop it a stop or maybe even two, but it's dangerous. Okay, and gain shift, um, that also allows you to uh, adjust your gain. Minus 3 dB is a very useful thing. Minus 3 dB is actually taking one stop off of your gain. Brightness, yeah. Of your brightness and giving you a more saturated picture. Title, I'm not even going to go near the titles, guys. You know my feelings on this. Don't put anything on your footage. Mark your tape if you need a date. And uh, do it in post-production if you have to have writing on the screen. You will regret it. Right, audio mode. It's, um, 32K, that's 32 kilohertz uh, and 48K. Mention on the, the little handy cam that 16 bits equates to 32K. And the 12 bit is very low quality, which this uh, 
yeah. broadcast style camera yeah. does not even support. To give you an idea, 44.100K is the audio CD quality. So this can record at a much higher rate. Mic level, you have a manual or an auto. If you're using manual, you push it, level set, you can set your level, push it again, and you can see my voice getting softer and softer. I really have to shout, to, and then if I lift it up, you can see that my voice registers very easily, even when I'm speaking. Until it starts breaking up, of course. Yeah, every time you see it hit those red things at the end there, you have digital breakup, which is ghastly. So don't do it. <laughs> Set your level. So ideal level one more time, guys, is somewhere riding up in about the two thirds, as you can see it now. Um, you need to be able to catch all your aspects, all the, the highs and lows of your sound without ever peaking too far. Color bars. That's the difference between professional and unprofessional. The color bars is your reference. It's your reference between your viewfinder, between your LCD display, and between whatever monitor you've got attached. So it's handy to have them on at the start of a shoot. You set all your TVs. Uh, to the color bar so that it looks similar. You accustom your eye. It's kind of about getting your eye used to the exposure levels of your viewfinder, LCD, and monitor as well, and getting them looking the same. And then you can shoot and expose with confidence using each of those interfaces. Then you know what you're watching when you play back on a tape. In those 30, in those first 30 seconds of color bars, what you are going to see, seeing on your monitor. Hi, we're going on to the V1E and I'm going to show you the controls and buttons and how to operate this camera and the menu. On the back here, same as all of the video cameras, to switch on, just rotate the knob to the right. That's where your record button, your main record button is. There's another record button on the top for when you're holding the handle at the top. And on the back here, you have three connections to give you output. You've got component out, composite out, and a HDV firewire out. HDV DV firewire out. Let me put this back in. Below that, you've got a power in. Much the same as all the other Sonys. There's a link connection on the top here which will give you control, your normal server button, which will zoom in and out. On the top there, you've got the photo button and an expanded focus button, which zooms in for you to, uh, to get your focus ahead of time. When you press it again, it zooms back out. There's also your battery release switch over here which will get your battery up and out. Moving on to the back of the camera here. This switch over here is your settings hold and lock knob. If you switch up to auto lock, everything is locked onto auto. Switch to the middle, you can set things, control your camera manually. If you put it on hold, it will keep everything exactly where you've set it. Keep it on the middle, then you've got manual control of your camera. As you can see, if you've got it in the middle, all of these switches, these three switches, which are your controls of your gain, your shutter speed and your white balance, and your roll click switch, actually have effect. In order to get control of the gain, make sure that your gain is highlighted. Then you can roll up and down on the gain and use the gain. If you press it again, it becomes auto and switches to whatever it needs to switch to. Okay, that's on auto as well. That is because in the first item of your menu, which you press the menu button to get into, the first item of your menu has three settings. Your dial assigned, which is this dial over here. That dial is assigned one of three settings. Those settings are exposure one, where your iris and your gain are on that dial. 
and your shutter speed is fixed. On exposure 2, the dial operates your iris and the rest are fixed. But, as I've discovered, on exposure 2, if you press your gain, you have control of it. And if it's highlighted, you have control of it. If you press it again, it is auto. Therefore, you need to leave it highlighted. That is on exposure 2. If you set your dial assign to iris, when you roll your iris knob and stop down, your gain is fixed where it is. If you take off the highlight, your gain will adjust. So in order to keep control of your exposure, you need to use this exposure iris button and your dial knob while selecting the correct setting on your menu in the first item of the camera menu, which is the dial assign. Exposure 2 keeps everything on auto so that when you have your scene going brighter, it just opens up for you. There's another setting in that same menu, which is AE Shift. When you select AE Shift, as you use your iris knob on the front here, it adjusts by shifting your exposure actually changes your iris without changing your dbs so that's like a normal manual control you can see on the histogram that we put on the right of your screen there where your exposure would preferably be with auto shift auto exposure shift you cannot actually use your gain unless you preset it in the menu in your menu when you set your dial assign onto exposure 1, your iris knob has got effect when you see the E and your gain is not affected. If you press your gain switch, you have no effect. If you press your exposure iris knob and it goes to auto, then when you dial you have no effect but your camera is on auto so any brighter objects it will actually expose for that object if you have your gain highlighted your gain will not move of its own accord your gain is not auto if you have your gain unhighlighted it will stay where you've set it when you select your menu and go to the second option in your menu it's called smooth slow record this is the new slow-mo recording facility on these V1E's um, you can start your recording with an end trigger after the event if you have some high-speed action such as a water drop falling as the drop has fallen you can press in other words, after the event, you press the button. That will record the previous three seconds. If you in end trigger mode, the record time is either 3, 6 or 12 seconds. So it will record the 3, 6 or 12 seconds that happened before you press when you're in end trigger mode. If you are in start trigger mode, You've also got 3, 6 or 12 seconds for the event that you want to capture in slow-mo to happen. You have to press execute to get it to happen. And then it's ready. When you see smooth slow record on your screen, 
and it'll tell you how long you've got. When you switch your menu off, smooth, slow record switches off. The next item on your menu is contrast enhancer. This is pretty simple. It's either got on or off, and you can see a slight difference in your contrast as you switch off and on. To stay in the camera side of the menu, I'm pressing my click roll switch and then scrolling down to the item I want. This next item is progressive scan, which this new V1E has got. Um, progressive scan at 25 frames per second on the V1E will give you uh, 25 frames stored in 50i format and um, when you use this, you must just watch out for panning across fences and upright objects too fast. You'll get a lot of shudder. After progressive scan, you've got steady shot. It's got on and off of your steady shot and the types. You've got hard, which, is, which handles uh, more unsteadiness. You've got standard for medium movements, you got soft for slight movement, you got wide conversion for when you're using a wide angle lens on your camera. So hard, hard is the one that you would definitely not use on legs because it'll really interfere with your operation. Color bars on or off. You can put tone on top of your bars. When you put bars on your camera, you can put a one kilohertz tone on top of those bars to give the person who's setting up the monitor time to adjust the volume on the monitor too. Autofocus assist allows you to, when it's on, allows you to focus while the autofocus is on, not entirely off. When you're on the wide lens, the macro focus will allow you to focus all the way to the lens. Can you see that there? Okay, you see how close I am to the lens? Yeah. Very soon after you go off the wide, as soon as you go tighter, you'll see that it just snaps out of focus. And then you've got no focus. So it's very useful that uh, macro focus, but uh, needs to you need to figure out the parameters for yourself. Back in the menu. Yeah, I see that, bro. Auto exposure shift. If you want a permanent auto exposure shift, see your histogram on the left there. See what it's doing for you as you permanently put your auto exposure shift. Minus seven down or zero or seven up so that your camera overexposes for you. One of those things you have to remember if you actually put it into the camera. Leave it on zero if there's no other way. Your auto exposure response um, can be, has got three settings of fast, middle and slow. Leave it on slow if possible, otherwise you might see the pumping as your exposure changes. Your auto gain control limit can be set so that uh, you don't get too much snow if you're staying on 12. 
So I would take it down to 6. You might need it to be on 12. Auto iris. Your auto iris limit can be set at any one of these three values, 4, 5.6, or 11. Your auto white sensor, if set on intelligent, will adjust your auto white according to the brightness of the scene. In the high, it will decrease the redness or blueness. If your color balance is too high, there's too much blue or too much red, it will decrease it. If you set it to low, it will increase the amount of red and blue when you set it on low. The next item on the menu after auto white sensor is flicker reduce. If you have any lights which are flickering, which means they're not running at multiples of 25 hertz, then you will switch on your flicker reduce to get rid of that flicker. And they say the camera will do it best it can. Yeah, sure. You can set the response of your handle zoom. Near your handle zoom, you've got three settings for that handle zoom. They are off, low in the middle, and high. That relates to the settings in your menu. So you can set for yourself those settings on your roller wheel. Okay, for instance, on your high speed zoom, you might want to punch into things, so you'll set it at eight. On your low, you'll set it on one. So that when you zoom, as you press it, zooms in like a bat out of hell. What are we set on here? I'm set on high. That was eight. Okay. If it's off, the zoom doesn't work at all. If it's on low, as I zoom, you get a very slow creep zoom happening. That's where one is. Okay. If you set your handle zoom on too high, your zoom has a very sharp start and is quite difficult to control. But you can now get into shots if you're using static lenses much quicker. You might set your low setting at a slightly higher setting so that you can control your zooms because this is far too slow to use on any normal shoot. Okay. After handle zoom, you've got shot transition. These are the settings for your shot transitions. You can go all the way up to 15 seconds on your shot transitions and all the way down to three and a half seconds. These transitions can be set into your assign buttons. Um, if you program shot transitions into one, two and three, remember that you can't edit them out. So using Shot transitions is not really a good idea. If you do use these things, linear has a sudden start and a sudden stop. Soft stop in transition curve has a softer stop but a sharp beginning. If you have soft transition, it starts slowly and it ends slowly. There's a start timer so that you can actually let the camera do its own thing if you need it to happen. Here's your standard interval record. You can have record times of 0.5 to 2 seconds. The interval between each of those shots can go from 30 seconds to 10 minutes in only those steps of 1 minute, 5 minutes and then 10 minutes. DV frame record if you want to do animation, this is the one to use. Spotlight is for when you are shooting someone standing in a spotlight. Hypergain. 
if you switch hyper gain on, you'll get 36 dBs gain. Let's have a look at what that does to that color chart. There we go. It's about 7 dBs per stop. Digital extender, we've spoken about this in the other ones. Goes to one and a half times what your physical lens would allow you, but degrades your picture. You see that difference there? You can fade into and out of your shots as well. Those will also be set onto your assign buttons. White fader in, black fader in. That's for editing in camera. And that's the end of the first page of your menu, which is your camera setting menu. Next we move on to audio. The audio set menu of the V1E has the same menu, a much shorter menu actually. Um, your DV audio mode is 48K. You don't want to go down to 32K unless you are matching another camera or matching a editing suite that needs to have 32K. Otherwise stay on the better rate of 48K. Mic noise reduction in the worst possible scenario, you might need to use that. XLR set in your audio set menu. When you're going to plug in a microphone, you actually have to come into this level of the menu and set your input one level to mic if you're going to have a mic in. If you're coming from a machine, such as a DV player or a, a desk, then you will go to line. Otherwise you're on mic. That means in input one, you'll be plugging in a mic. You can trim it down if it's a bit too loud. Um, you can cut off wind noise. So, in order to get the sound into there, if you're using an external mic, plug that external mic into input one so that your editor gets sound on channel one. So, in your menu, in the audio section of your menu, you go into XLR set and if you're using two microphones you will set to separate and you will switch from channel 1 comma channel 2 down to what's called channel 1 but which means each microphone that comes in from input 1 will actually go to channel 1 the microphone in input 2 will go to channel 2. So you have separate sound. As you look at the, uh, if you look at your sound volumes, your sound levels, you will see that when you tap channel 1 mic, which is our external mic, it's going there. It has its own level, which you can set on this pot here. As I turn it down, it gets lower and lower. So I'll set the level up there, a bit high, round about there. And I can also set my mic, my on-camera mic. It's giving me backup sound, but it's going to be at a different level because it's a different sensitivity. We're able to set the levels on these two channels because we have switched down to the separate channel position. If we set it to the linked channel position, then your levels will stay the same and it will only take channel 1, which will be external mic because it's in input 1.
as I'm tapping there. If you link it in your menu, when you switch off, this switch over here supersedes what you have in your menu. Okay, when you're setting your sound inputs, if you need to set your levels, make sure that your auto manual switch is on manual. Otherwise, your sound levels are going to be automatically kept at a certain level and will pump up to try and maintain a little bit of sound when there's a hiss or buzz in the background. If you're using an external mic in channel 1, for instance, you will switch your 48 volts off. There is a possibility of damage to microphones when you switch 48 volts into a mic that is already powered. So don't, so keep it off when you're plugging in and if you need it, you can switch on. This camera mic that comes with the Z1e or with any camera usually needs 48 volts phantom power. If the microphone that you're attaching to your camera has a battery, it most probably does not need 48 volt phantom power. This next item in your menu called peaking is helpful for when focusing. If you switch on your peaking, it will allow you to see whether things are in focus or not. And you can change the color of that peaking to white, red or yellow. When it's in focus, you get a rim happening around the objects that are in focus. If they're out of focus, it disappears. The more of this red effect you have, the sharper your picture is. When it disappears totally, everything's, everything's actually soft. And as you can see, this only reflects on the LCD panel and in your eyepiece. It does not reflect in your recorded picture. The next item in your menu is histogram. If you switch it on, you actually see a histogram which allows you to correct your exposure. Or well, not correct your exposure, but see what your colors are doing in picture. A good guide as to what's overexposed and what's underexposed. The next item on your menu is marker. If you switch on your marker, you can select a center marker, which will give you a cross in the center of your picture. If you select guide frame and switch it on, then you will get your theoretical composition points of where you put important objects on the crosses, on the intersection of the lines. That all gets in the way, so rather leave that guide frame off because you know where they are. Your safety zone at 80% is your title safe zone, which gives you the title safe edges so that you are inside the outside edges of domestic TV screens. After exposure focus, we have all scan mode. All scan mode is the full picture you can get from your camera. Similar to underscan on a production monitor, which doesn't make a difference to your footage. Just allows you to see in your LCD right to the edges of your recorded picture. This display switch allows you to see in your viewfinder and monitor all the data that you need to see. The next item on the menu after 
camera data display is audio level display. If you switch it off, you can't see your audio levels when you're shooting, which is not really a good idea. It's one of those things that you want to have available to you when you are shooting. So rather leave it on and then in the bottom right corner you can see what's happening to your audio levels. Okay, If you need to quickly see what the status of your camera is, you can press status check. That will show you what's happening in your audio. It will show you everything that is happening to your camera, all the things you've set, what's assigned to your switches, what your dial assigns are, your contrast. It will actually give you a quick reflection on your whole menu. The next item on your menu is zoom display, which comes in two options, bar and number. After zoom display, you can display your focus in either meters or feet, depending on what you're used to working in, to see if it's actually on the object you think it's on. You can also display your shutter in seconds or degrees. Your LCD brightness should always be kept in the middle so that you don't start overexposing to compensate if you're judging with your LCD as a reference and shouldn't be too bright so that you don't underexpose when using it as a reference. That's one of the reasons why we use the eyepiece. Leave it in the middle. Your LCD color shouldn't be changed either because you're going to start judging your white balance incorrectly as well. Your LCD backlight level should be left on normal for exterior shooting if you're using it as a reference for exposure. If you set it to bright, it actually pumps up the picture a little bit and you might expose incorrectly. You'll get used to it, so just keep it what you're used to. Your viewfinder backlight has the same problem. Nobody can see that. Leave it on normal. Your viewfinder color can be set to off so that you have a black and white picture, which gives you a better judgment of contrast and focus. Your viewfinder power mode can be set to auto. Tape remaining display, you want that to come up and show you you've got very little tape left. The display output you've seen before, the display output will allow you to go only to your LCD panel or to your video out and your LCD panel. That's the end of that page of the menu. In your in out record page of your menu you have recording format, which gives you a HDV 1080i or DV, DV cam, in other words. Select whichever mode you need. This is one of the first steps of setting up your camera just before a shoot. In your DV record mode, you've either got DV cam or DVSP which will last you 60 minutes a tape. In DV cam, it will last you 40 minutes a tape. DV cam is better quality by about 30%. DV wide record will use the whole chip in this camera to record slightly more information on the sides of your frame. You can switch your external record control off with your commander or your remote control by switching on. Component can either be 576i or 1080 by 576i. Next item is iLink conversion. 
If you need to link to your computer, have this on. If you don't, leave it off. This down convert item in your menu is the way you see your video on a 9 inch monitor. In viewfinder power mode, if you switch on, your viewfinder will stay on. If you switch it to auto, your viewfinder will be off when your LCD screen is open. When you close your LCD screen, your viewfinder comes on. This is to save power on your battery. In the next page of your main camera menu, you have your time code page. In order to set time code onto a new tape, you go into time code preset. Go to reset, reset your preset. If you want to name it time code 1, you press again, roll up 1 to tape number 1, or tape number 2, or tape number 3, press again, leave these at 0, or set them if you need to match a time code, press again, press again, until you get back to OK. Press OK when you've set your time code to the correct tape number. Go down to time code run and make sure it's on record run. Go to time code make and go to preset. That will set your time code to one. Ready to start recording bars on or just record from there. Your user bit is an ID that you can type in. In time code run, you can select either record run, which will record your time code whenever you record. It will pick up from the previous time code that is on your tape. On free run, when any of the cameras record, they will record the time that is recorded on their tape, out of sync, which won't give you time code breaks, but will allow the editor to match up the times that anyone shot, if they were shooting synchronously. Okay, the memory set. This memory stick is for your smooth run. On your memory stick, which fits into a slot here, will allow you to record onto that memory chip. You can choose whether you want standard or fine quality pictures in order to save space. If, if an item in your menu is grayed out, it is not available for you to change. On the last page of your menu, after camera profile, you have the assign button function. If you want to assign a function to any one of these buttons on the front of the camera, you can assign anything in this whole list. You can engage your hypergain on one of those buttons, your digital extender, your all scan mode, your focus and infinity, which is very useful for this camera, record review, end search, index mark, peaking, steady shot, color bars, if you want to put them on the front of the thing, it's easier to do on a button than in the menu. You can assign your focus macro, your spotlight, your backlight, your fader, your display, and any one of your picture profile menus from one to six onto one of those buttons if you need to change it at the touch of a button. For instance, we had bars on that and we are going to we are going to assign peaking onto that. Just click onto it and it'll go to peaking. If we go to button two, we can put hyper gain onto it. So, when you accept that, if you press button number one, it will give you your peaking at the touch of that button. Button number two was hyper gain. As you know, hyper gain's quite snowy, so don't use it.
deselect by pushing the button again. None of those are visible. The hyper gain is visible, but your peaking is not visible on the recorded image. The next item on the menu after the assign button function is photo and expanded focus options. The photo or expanded focus button can be here or on the front, down in front of the focus button. Here's your expanded focus button. If you go on to expanded focus and accept it, when you press the expanded focus button, it will zoom in so that you can set your focus manually or with your autofocus button. When you press it again, it will come back to your normal lens size. Back into the menu. You've got a clock set here in case you need to use your camera for court cases or accident scenes or security camera and you can actually record that time code onto your recorded picture. Don't engage it unless you need to because you can't get rid of it but if you do need to it's available. You can set your world time ahead or behind for the same for the same reasons. Your language can be English or any one of these supported languages. Quick records not available as you see it's grayed out. Date record is where you would switch on that date and time just by simply switching it on. The beep can be irritating and is a useful reminder but beeps when you go on and when you go off. Record lamp can be on or off. We know we've spoken about that. Remote control needs to be on or off if you're using your remote to switch your camera on from a distance. The hours meter tells you how long your camera has been operating, how long your drum's been running, your tape's been running and how long it's been threaded. That is the end of the menu. If you're going to engage one of your picture profiles or set your picture profile settings, you press your picture profile button. Then on your roll click switch, scroll down to one of your picture profile numbers, like picture profile number five. Click again, go to setting. In there, you can set your color level, which will enhance your chroma or make your picture more black and white. Okay, so if we want to desaturate our colors, we go down to suitable level. Your color phase will take you around your chart and enhance certain colors depending on where you set it. The sharpness can be set or your sharpness can be decreased to a, a less crisp picture which is preferable because video is usually too sharp. Seven is the middle of that value scale. Skin tone detail, you can have a couple of types of skin tone detail. Skin tone level, you can set your skin tone levels all the way from 6 down to 1 with a medium setting of 3. White balance shift, quite useful. You can go all the way up to 7 or down to minus 7. If you're down at minus 7, you will be more on the blue side of things. If you're at If you're on the top of your scale at plus seven, you will be 
going more towards the orange. You can set your knee point to high, which will affect the way your camera reads the whites, or middle or low. Your knee point is the top acceptance level of the whites in picture, of your brightest colors. Black compensation. You can decrease the distance between your blacks and whites by using stretch, or you can compress your black, which is called crushing your blacks. You can stretch them, or you can crush them, or you can leave it off standard. Have a look. Compare the difference between compress and off and stretch and off. That's the effect of your black compensation. Cinema Tone adjusts your gamma curve, which is similar to the black compensation. It'll move your gamma curve up give you a more compressed picture, a more crushed picture. Type 2 Gamma Cinematone crushes your blacks further and enhances your colors. Cinematone color. Off and on shows you a difference, just saturates your colors a little bit more. You can name your profile by choosing a letter. As you roll up on your switch, and then you can give it a number, and then you can accept it by saying OK. Picture profiles are um, a range of settings to affect your colors and gammas and crush your blacks to certain levels so that in a scene, if you shoot on this scene, you can store it in your camera and then come back to one of these picture profiles. For instance, you might use portrait when shooting someone then you go outdoors and use cinema, and then when you come back to the following day of shooting that person again, you will use portrait again. And you can just dial it up in here and select it. Then on, the, on your LCD of your screen, you will see PP1, and it will show you which of your picture profiles you're actually using. merely by pressing merely by pressing your picture profile button on the bottom of your camera going up to your desired picture profile saying okay and it will tell you that you're on picture profile so if you're on picture profile it means you have got odd settings which are not standard. If you're not up to speed on what your picture profile says and you see picture profile on your LCD screen, click picture profile, go to off. And you will have a standard setting. Under the little flap on the side of your camera at the bottom, you have a USB connection for, for transferring photos and um, one of the slower connections if you need to use it. Here's your display and battery info switch. When using your VCR, here are the controls. Normal play, rewind, fast forward, slow and stop. With a pause record. And the button that you push when you record in VCR mode. You have a zebra switch, which will take you to 70 or 100. Not recorded on your image just for the viewer to see where his highlights are in the whites.
or where the whites are overexposing. This volume and memory switch is the volume of your earphones. Can you see this earphone switch? Whenever you record sound, it's a very good idea to actually plug in your earphones so that you can hear so that you can hear what's coming through the microphones. Whether you have extraneous dogs barking, hums, buzzes, crackles or pops. When you press your focus button, your camera goes into manual focus off. In other words, autofocus. You press it again, you can actually go to manual focus and then when you move your focus ring on the front of the lens it actually shows you in meters or feet depending on what you selected where your focus is set that is focus mode that is manual focus mode so when you press again it'll go to manual focus off your focus ring will have no effect until you press if you want to get an autofocus, you can go and press the temporary focus button. It will give you a focus while you're on manual. The ring behind your focus ring is a zoom ring. 